From Wine Enthusiast Magazine, this is the Wine Enthusiast Podcast. Coming up on today's podcast, food and wine pairings, steak and Cabernet Sauvignon, salmon, and Pinot Noir. What makes classic pairings so, well, perfect? What's the science behind the perfect pairing? A chef and a sommelier deconstruct with contributing editor Nils Bernstein the art of how to pair food and wine. The algorithm to any young cook for me to really make food exciting is balancing salt, acid, and fat. Yeah. And that's totally translatable to wine. The fat being the texture of the wine, the olive oil in a dish, or and the acidity obviously it could be it could be citrus, it could be vinegar, it could be ferment and then salt and salinity in a wine. For me, being versatile in pairing is crucial to, to having a, an enjoyable food experience. Plus, CBD oil from hemp is now legal in all 50 states, and medical experts have hailed CBD as the future of medicine. But what about the future of cocktails? Spirits editor Karen Newman talks with the owner of New York's first CBD cocktail bar and restaurant, about the increasing popularity of CBD-infused cuisine and spirits. I have been always curious about uh, different kind of combinations, uh, uh, methods, as far as fat washing, oil washing, infusions, and also I start uh, actually looking into the the wellness part of it, and then CBD become very much in front of the front pages in every area as far as health and then wellness and that's what I was thinking to uh, start cooperating into our cocktails. However, no one does it, done it before, so it was kind of an interesting twist. Plus, wine myths, wine basics and more all coming up on the Wine Enthusiast Podcast. Apron Wine. Every wine club promises to send you tasty reds and whites, but only Blue Apron Wine partners with the world's best winemakers to get you incredible reds and whites. We're talking Vinoble Boyat Morgot, 91 points from Wine Enthusiast, and Mathiasen, nominated for a 2018 James Beard Award. Get $25 off your first shipment of six wines at blueapron.com slash corkscrew. The most successful food and wine pairings feature complementary components, richness, and textures. Great food pairing comes from an understanding of how the characteristics of a dish play a role in making memorable wine pairings. Food editor Nils Bernstein discusses with chef Eric Boyard and sommelier Amy Racine how food and wine pairings work and how you too can create your own perfect pairings. I'm here talking about wine and food pairing with Amy Racine from The Loyal in New York City's West Village and Eric Boyard from Compagnie des Vins Sur Naturel. Amy, to you first. What are your concerns when you think about pairing with a dish? What qualities in the wine? Is it acidity, weight, texture, region? What are you thinking about? I mean, I definitely think acidity is important, but I do agree that maybe I'll speak for myself only. I lean towards acidity as something that I look for, maybe a little bit more than tannins and body right away. Right, right. And Eric, you're a chef at a wine-centric restaurant. When you're developing dishes, as a non-wine person, how do you think about wine when you're creating dishes? Well, I mean, I think the cool thing about what we do here at Compagnie is that, you know, there's it's about 60% traditional wines, 35 40% uh, from around the world. So that right there provides such a a breadth of spectrum of which we have wines available to pretty much go with anything that I so choose to create, uh, which is a leisure, I think that you could say. You know, these guys have a strong knowledge to be able to put anything that I create with something phenomenal. They make my job easy in that regard. At the same time, it is always a dialogue. We have started to have more of a conversation, the sommeliers and myself in the kitchen. In in recent months, we've started these wine boot camps 
that are high intensity interval drinking a 50 minute class really devoted to exploring a very specific region or a grape or a style and within each one of those classes we do a very fun distinct wine pairing with one of those wines so that's opened up a conversation with myself and the sommeliers so much more than previously it's always been a dialogue but now it's twice a week we're exploring unusual things and pairings that may be typical or trying to uncover a pairing that's rather atypical to really just prove a point to all of the guests at the boot camps that this works for these reasons no fluff you know yeah. frills like not what what are you getting from this wine but like this is why this wine is meant to be this way so that and, the whole restaurant is thinking in those terms the wine side the food side the service everybody's kind of has some and hopefully educating the guest in that way as well that yeah. there's certain things that are not meant to be broken and there's certain things that are meant to be broken we can kind of really hone in on exactly which is which something that's often said is what grows together goes together so Amy, do you have any thoughts about that, that there is some sense to pairing wine with food from the same region? Yes. I was just thinking when, whenever I'm stuck with a pairing and I've tried a few things and maybe it's just not working or nothing's really singing together, I think about if this was a dish from any place in the world, where would it be from? And then once you start working with those wines, if it's something that's a little bit more Alsatian, start leaning towards those wines and then those tend to make sense or at least open up a door to get you into what makes the most sense but I definitely think about it quite a bit. It's interesting how it it really does kind of work you know and maybe it's something as simple as coastal wines that might have a salinity that might go with seafood because you're in a coastal region but it really kind of works throughout the world it or at least it like you're saying it might put your mind in a different different headspace to just think of different ideas. Absolutely and it it helps paint the picture as well when you're speaking to the guests about it like you were mentioning coastal wines and if you start talking about Albarino and Ria Spicious and start painting the picture of what it's like to be standing there and how you can smell the salinity in the air and then you taste this wine and you get this brininess and it definitely elevates the experience but also kind of ties more personal personal emotions and memories that you might have to that dish and to that wine and it makes it a little bit of a fuller experience yeah and wine is food, of course, so, and they both have that commonality in that way when you can really paint a picture of a place or have food that's really illustrative of a place. It makes the whole experience that much better. Something, something else I think about with wine and food pairing is uh, somebody once, when I was much younger, illustrated to me that some people like lobster with butter, some people like lobster with lemon. And that's a good example where you can pair, let's say, an oaky Chardonnay might go with lobster in the same way that butter might and a Riesling might go with lobster in the same way that a squeeze of lemon might. When we talk about wine and food pairing, you can look at complementary flavors or contrasting flavors. And is that, are those equally valid? Do you tend toward one or the other? How do you think about that? I look at it both ways and I've heard there's plenty of sommeliers and chefs out there that have different opinions than, than I, but with for example, very spicy Thai food and a Riesling that has a little bit of sugar. I think that's a great kind of classic example and kind of ties back to, I think, of wine as a way to elevate your meal. And it's kind of like seasoning, like you were mentioning, lemon over lobster or whatever it might be. It's all about tying back into each other. I do enjoy contrast because I think it could be shocking and, and fun and complimentary for usually obvious reasons. Eric, do you, as you're kind of learning about wine and thinking about wine in the context of what you do here, are, are you thinking about wine as an ingredient, as a sauce? How do you make it make sense in your head? We definitely cook with wine a lot here for no particular reason other than that's what that particular dish is calling for. I do agree that there are those golden rules that heavy with heavy, light with light. But I also agree that another golden rule is that opposites attract. And I think the way people cook now, you know, we're not just eating grilled steak with roasted vegetables and mashed potatoes. We're having, there's a lot of different, there's sweet, salty, sour happening at once. There's, there might be a meat, fish and vegetable elements coexisting. You might be pulling from a lot of different uh, cuisines from around the world. So it's hard to, these kind of rules that you know, we've all heard over the years that white wine with fish, cab with steak, these kind of things that I, those don't necessarily hold true anymore because there's so many other textural and flavor elements that you're thinking about. Yeah. I'm going to do a little lightning round contest with Amy here, looking at some kind of traditional pairings. 
and what you might see as an alternative pairing. Okay. A classic steakhouse grilled steak that might typically be paired with a big Napa cab. What's another red that might work there? Or white, oh, whatever. I'd still go red, but you could get into older Barolo or reds from northwestern Spain. I'm on a big Bierzo kick right now. Yeah, yeah. cool. Oysters. You might think a Chablis, a Muscadet. Where else might you go? You could go to Fino Sherry. Ooh, uh, yeah. I'd probably go something really briny still. Yeah. I think Fino Sherry would probably work well. Yeah, that's a nice idea. I think that little bit of salinity. I had a, a bunch of oysters recently with a Sirtico, mm -hmm. and it made a lot of sense because oh, yeah, that... it had that same cool. quality. How about caviar if you didn't want to go with champagne? Oof. Speaking of That's Brian. A wild, that's <laughs> yeah. a wild card. That is yeah. a wild card. I think there's definitely a wide variety of new exciting sparklings out there. England has some kind of cool sparklings now. I would still kind of tie back to the same going for brininess kind of a thing. Mm -hmm. What would you do? Uh, I don't know. Yeah, maybe what some, are you thinking? Maybe some pet nut from, from Australia, yeah. perhaps. It's hard to get away from sparkling because, yeah. you know. It is. But yeah. those, yeah, maybe uh, you dry just. Dry Riesling, maybe. Like Clare Valley dry Riesling. Yeah. Or a gin martini, maybe? I was also thinking spirits, <laughs> but I, <laughs> I was also going to make a Miller High Life joke, yeah. but I <laughs> um, <laughs> didn't know if it's that kind of a podcast. Uh, how about, I, I yeah, my uh, it's always, to, yeah. yeah. My favorite way to uh, Forever. Create, create food, yeah. We're big uh, uh, cross drinkers at Wine Enthusiasts, <laughs> so Miller High Life, absolutely. How about blue cheese, which is a really fantastic pairing with a vintage port, for example? It is. It's great with port and great with sauterne with extreme sugar and mm -hmm. extreme saltiness. But I also think the drier versions of those wines, like a aged semillon, again, back to mm -hmm. Australia, but an older aged semillon that's kind of developed more mushroomy, umami flavors can be great. A wine with some sugar is definitely a classic pairing with that saltiness. But anything that kind of has that honeyed kind of yeah. aroma can tie you into that. But then I think you can definitely still go dry. And that's kind of a, again, thinking of wine as an ingredient almost, you know, sweet and salty obviously is a great pairing and it really works in the wine sphere as well. A little sweetness with a really salty dish can work really nicely. Let's look at some of Eric's, some of your stuff on the menu now and see if there's any pairings that really stand out to you that you've had here that kind of opened your eyes about the magic of wine and food pairing. We have a, a cacio e popcorn, we call it. It's a, it's a play on the Roman pasta sauce, cacio e pepe, and there's like three types of pecorino in there. A ton of black pepper, 45 grinds for every order of uh, <laughs> fresh, wow. freshly popped popcorn, and champagne and, and cacio e pepe popcorn is super exciting i love drinking something so delicious and so refined from such a classic region with something as simple and fun and convivial as that another thing that really excites me when pairing wine and food or having a conversation with with our guys about pairing food and wine is the charred charred element in food mm -hmm. and blackening some product and having that play off wines from volcanic soils um i get most excited about, you know, Mount Etna and Cornelison. And that was one of the first wines that really raptured me when I first started to really delve into wine when I was just starting to cook. Uh, right now we just put on a fun little crudite. It's, it's local cabbage, funky and charred kohlrabi, which is kind of having a, a moment, but we char that and really intense Caesar dip. And then um, a dulce, which is a, a briny, Kind of red seaweed uh, that we make into a powder but you have this these charred elements on the cabbage and the kohlrabi and the richness and then playing off those cloudier unfiltered volcanic soil uh, sicilian or or um, volcanic wines it that's that feels that's right that to have a feels right it's, volcanic wine with charred food it just feels feels right accurate it, it's it's one of my favorite things yeah. to eat if i had to sit down and, and have a bite yeah that sounds good um, so we've brought up champagne a few times, which in my opinion is one of the foolproof pairing wines. Champagne really goes with almost anything. Mm -hmm. So Amy, do you have any other kind of go-to wines? Sparkling, white, red, rosé, that when you can't figure out what to pair, or maybe it's a meal that has a lot of different elements, something that might bridge a lot of different dishes. Yeah, I think Gruner Rettliner is a good way mm -hmm. to go if it's if there's a lot going on. I mean, I do love 
champagne and the still version of that chablis i think goes well yeah. with everything and back to riesling too both chardonnay and riesling come in such a spectrum you can usually find some version of it can work with anything and common to all those that you mentioned is acidity they all have a yep, there nice we go balance again. of acidity <laughs> it does make sense though eric you wouldn't you likely wouldn't make a dish that didn't have some sort of balancing acidity or some sort of all of our fruit pops you should really get like a little bit of a smack in the face when you take a bite of, of most of the food. In certain respects, there's, you know, a dish that you don't want that to play a role, but 95% of the time, you really want that high acid, but balanced, of course, yep. salt and acid and fat. I mean, that's the algorithm to any young cook for me to really make food exciting balancing salt acid and fat yeah and that's totally translatable to wine the fat being the texture of the wine the olive oil in a dish or and the acidity obviously it could be it could be citrus it could be vinegar it could be a ferment and then salt and the salinity in a wine um, and just savory elements savory general, elements yeah. yeah for me being versatile and pairing is crucial to to having a an enjoyable food experience, especially in a setting like this where it's not as choreographed a meal as maybe some traditional restaurants or tasting menu spots. It's kind of a more shareable, convivial free for all where, you know, this can come out first and the thing you ordered after could come out simultaneously with that. And you want to have those bridge wines, you want to have those versatile wines, Bordeaux Semillon, Austrian Riesling, Loire Chenin, these really textured whites that go well with food, pet nat, and Pet Nat Rosé, those carry course to course seamlessly for me. One of my favorite, favorite regions, Beaujolais, mm -hmm. can do the same. Fun, funky, fresh, pink bubbles. Maybe in, in conversation, I'm realizing that those excite me the most because I can drink them with anything I'm eating. And food is obviously at the forefront of my mind always. And they have the same balance that you're talking about that you like with dishes, where it's a balance between body, fruit, acidity, a savory element. Right. It can be it's lush, but it's still always asking you for more. Yeah. yeah. What are some takeaways for people at home that are some kind of, you know, basic ingredients, home cooking? What are some kind of rules that people might think about when they're at the wine shop thinking of what to bring home? I think speaking to whoever's working in the wine shop is a great way to go, especially for entertaining. I think Burgundy and, like I was saying before, Gruner Vatliner, Verdicchio, a lot of Italian whites are great for picking up for a party. Beaujolais, like you were mentioning, is great. Just ask for anything that's like a lighter bodied red or more textural or slightly fuller white, I think is a great just wine to have out. If you buy a couple of bottles and leave them out, everybody will be happy no matter what you're cooking and mm -hmm. no matter what you're serving. I think the fun thing is if you do go into a wine store, and you are having guests, you are doing some entertaining. I think challenging your guests, albeit in a restaurant setting, a wine bar setting, or at your home setting, challenging your guests slightly just to push them a bit further than they were when they walked in the door, and then setting them up for success. But if you go to your wine store and you're, and you're looking to entertain and you have the basics that people are gonna expect, ask the guy, ask the gal in the wine store, what is, one step away from this classic grape that people may not know about that can be way more conversational and way more prevalent today or finally discovered and given a little more justice to and introducing that without straying it so far from those flavor profiles those characters i'm trying to think of an example no, but it's instead I, of like, a Pinot Noir, do a wow, Zweigelt. Frankish or, or Zweigelt, yeah, yeah exactly. Um, and instead then, of Sauvignon Blanc, do a Grillo from Sicily. Or something. And to me, that's what excites me about wine. You know, I'm still novice in the grand scheme mm -hmm. of the wine world, but being able to challenge someone through food, presenting something to them that they had a, a preconceived notion about, mm -hmm. had a poor experience as a, as a child, their mother, their grandmother, or never seasoning something or just boiling something or never. This is what I'm passionate about in cooking. This is the half the reason I cook is changing people's preconceived notions about something because they haven't had it in its most well-presented form. If they had a horrible uh, Albarino, that's their, their benchmark for what Albarino yeah. is, or if I mean, they've I never had... I had a really traumatic Albarino experience as a child, and it's been really hard to right. and, get over. And I, same, same, same with mushrooms, beets, asparagus, yeah. fennel, salmon, because it was never presented to you where, where you were 
you know, emphasizing its its beauty and its its character in the yeah. best possible way. You're accentuating its, you know, its drab instead right. of the opposite. Okay, so we're talking about kind of experimenting and having fun with wine and food pairings. A friend of mine recently said that just because when he was younger, first time he had beer, he had it with Pop-Tarts, and to this day he's really obsessed with pairing beer and Pop-Tarts, which <laughs> makes some sense. Sweet, salty, it's cutting through the richness of the Pop-Tart. So I have one, I'm, I really love Sotern, and I found that Sotern and fried chicken is an incredible pairing. Oh, nice. nice. The acidity, the sweetness, somehow it really works. Amy, do you have any anything like that that's your your guilty pairing? Uh, I, yeah, I don't feel guilty. It's Cheetos, <laughs> Cheetos and champagne. Oh. Just that mm. after work, watching TV, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. unwinding. Or Fritos. Fritos are good, too. Eric, anything? <laughs> guilty pleasure pairing? <laughs> oh, man. Um, that's tricky. It's hard it's to beat tri- Fritos and champagne. Yeah, I mean, you guys really <laughs> put it out there on another planet. <laughs> I would have to default to like a really high acidic, bubbly, chocolatey from the mm-hmm. Basque country, with with just a big plate of anchovies. Yeah, that's <laughs> yeah. Nice. I mean, oil cured anchovies and like that really high acid driven chocolatey, which is something I drank a ton of when I was cooking in the Basque country. Those will never go away. Chocolatey is another good kind of a fallback go to pairing wine. It really goes with almost anything right and it really opens people up to you know something that they haven't necessarily encountered before or often yeah. and it's it's more readily available now so i say go for it yeah i think people are really experimental now cooking at home and they're trying new preparations looking up new recipes but they're maybe a little more reluctant to have that same sense of adventure in the wines that they're serving Mm -hmm. and i think what both of you are saying is you just have that same sense of adventure and experimentation in the wine shop as you do in the restaurant or in your your home home kitchen kitchen. you can have a really amazing experience suck them into the bottle like a (laughs) genie and then never (laughs) let them out someone asked for three wishes (laughs) i mean there should be a little bit more you know willingness to explore there's so much available now so many more undiscovered producers and undiscovered regions and the classic things I appreciate and respect deeply but the under the radar producers where you can actually find better deals you know from some Portuguese producer that's never been seen and just started getting imported to America that's where the discovery happens that's where it's exciting to see something that a, a grape that you have never seen before and you realize that that's your new favorite thing and no no meal made up of great food and great wine has ever been ruined by an imperfect pairing. Right, for sure. You're still drinking yeah. wine. And you're still, still eating, eating food. food. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Be happy. Yeah, well, on that note, thank you so much. Thanks, Eric. Thanks, Amy. Thank you. Absolutely. Next, wine enthusiast tasting director Alex Peartree dispels some classic wine myths. And on today's wine myths, I'm going to debunk another common wine myth that serious, age worthy wines are always sealed with cork. The reality is that screw cap wines can age just as well as those sealed with cork, and sometimes even longer. Some people associate screw caps with cheap wine. However, there are plenty of super premium red wines from countries like Australia. You don't need a cork to be classy. If you've got a wine myth that needs to be debunked, email me at apeartree at wineenthusiast.net. I'm Alexander Peartree. Thanks for listening. Blue Apron Wine. Only the best vineyards and winemakers make the cut for a Blue Apron wine box, and every amazing wine is just $10 per bottle. Best of all, each wine comes with the backstory on who made it, where, and why. All so you understand why the wine tastes and smells the way it does. Want to learn more about wine? Blue Apron is the place to start. Get $25 off your first shipment at blueapron.com slash corkscrew. Terms and conditions apply. All orders are handled by Blue Apron Wine, Napa, California.
And you're listening to the Wine Enthusiast Podcast. The Adrian Block Restaurant, named after the famed Dutch explorer who's best known for having Block Island named after him, continues its pioneer heritage by exploring the relatively new territory of CBD cocktails. Spirits editor Kara Newman visited the Astoria New York-based restaurant to have a brief outdoor chat with its owner about what led to the creation of the first CBD restaurant and bar in New York City. And I'm here in Astoria, Queens, at Adrian Block with George Sanka, who is the owner of this lovely establishment. It's the only restaurant in the New York area that focuses on CBD drinks and food. Is that correct? CBD drinks, absolutely yes. I see some of the CBD food items they coming out in different restaurants, but as far as cocktails, this is the only and the first CBD cocktail bar in New York City. So let's talk about what I'm, I'm drinking here. What is this in front of me? You're drinking a Stony Negroni. We had a Flo de Gascon. You have some nice uh, sherry, which we use a Taylor Flaggate, and then, and then a touch of Lillette. And then, and of course, you get the orange peel, and then you have a service serving in a nice old-fashioned rock glass. And of course, the infusion, we do infuse it with uh, our CBD hemp. I, I want to emphasize that, that we're still using uh, Everyday Optimal as our uh, suppliers. So that's a very reliable source. Uh, we do have all the lab reports and all that to back up the company as far as make sure that we're using a really good company. Okay. I'm starting to learn a little bit about the CBD, so wait, correct me where I'm, I'm wrong. My understanding is that uh, it's all a, an extract of, of the cannabis plant. Correct. Uh, but CBD is can be all oil. It's an oil base, uh, but could be a flower base as well. Okay. Basically, this is just an extraction. So the two parts they build in is one of them is a THC part and one of them the oil base. So if you separate the THC from the oil base, you just have left with the oil base only. Okay. And so. the THC is the part that will. It's a hyperactive, yes, it's a, it's a psychoactive part, which and we're actually taking out from the... This is just the CBD, which promotes wellness? It's wellness, promotes wellness, promotes a nice uh, sensations, calmness. Lots of people using for different kind of areas to comfort them. Could be relaxation, could be uh, different kind of pains, inflations, insomnia. Some uh, doctors' uh, offices describe it as cancerous. Um, actually, a couple of days ago, just came out. Two days ago, the very first time came out that CBD is the best cure meant for epilepsy. Okay, I mean, CBD is huge. I'm drinking this, I'm, I'm not feeling anything, but I've only had one sip. Right. Um, but okay, so. Five minutes you will feel it okay. once you finish your first drink. Okay. So how did you get into this? What was your journey to building this uh, CBD restaurant in Hong The journey behind it, uh, I have been always curious about uh, cocktailing. I have been always curious about uh, different kind of combinations, uh, uh, methods as far as fed washing, oil washing, infusions. And also I start uh, actually looking into the, the wellness part of it. And as it become very much in front of the front pages, in every area as far as health and then wellness and that's what I was thinking to uh, start cooperating into our cocktails. However, no one does it, done it before so it was kind of an interesting twist to uh, figure it out like what would be the perfect balance to have alcoholic beverage infusion with CBD. So you've always been in the, the restaurant and bar business before this? Yes, I have uh, since age 14. Okay, wow. I'm not telling how old I am, how old I am wow. right now. <laughs> I started in Europe, Eastern Europe, doing college education. I was working by the little lake, Balaton, in Hungary. In, in Hungary, oh. and then after that, I uh, went up oh, to the to correct. Then I went up to uh, the capital, Budapest, and then after I started working in cruise line companies, Royal Caribbean, and from that moved to uh, New Jersey, and I started corporations, um, Cormac and Schmick, and all that. Um, worked for a larger steakhouse. They filmed The Godfather in the Madison Hotel and after that, you know, back in Hawaii, Vegas, Miami, yes. I have done my fair share of uh, hospitality industry yeah, from every aspect of it, from making a bread from Le Pen Cotidien to, to serving drinks. Did something special bring you to New York and Astoria? New York uh, education. I finished up my college education in here, in John Jay College, in criminal justice. <laughs> Thanks. That was the main reason I moved here and also I like the upbeat environment. 
where businesses just can boom and then you find the fashion, you find the real estate, you find the finance and then you find the, the hospitality industries in this one tremendous city, all in. And what drew you personally to, to CBD? Most people are looking into, uh, including myself, to the personal wellness, meaning that mindfulness, the way you are uh, looking into what you're eating today, as far as uh, what kind of exercise you're doing, as far as you set up your home base to be comfortable and balance your workplace, you try to manage it, like make sure that you get the work balance with, uh, with your life, your private life. It's same with the drinks, like you want to make sure that you get a balance so everybody able to actually chill and have a nice moment with a partner and a continued conversation without having too many drinks and forgetting what he was talking about. <laughs> <laughs> and I like that on your menu. I mean, you can have alcoholic drinks or no, uh, CBD drinks or no, and same thing with the, the food. I mean, some of it would be option to add uh, CBD spike sauce. Correct. Yes. We just start experimenting that we're getting more and more deep twin. We start with the whipped cream, CBD infused whipped cream. Whip cream. Okay. Yes, to our desserts and then to the crepes. And now we're actually adding up to our uh, cut of meat, like steaks. We do uh, burnet sauce with CBDs, we do uh, demi glasses with CBDs. Really? Okay. Yes, uh, we're having different kind of uh, dessert options, like we're making sauces like a caramel lavender uh, sauce with CBD or a dark chocolate mint with CBD, and we're changing dessert menus as well. So, yes, we are getting more into the, the food items as well. And then, the big seller on the menu? As far as food? Yeah. As, far, as far as food right now, my burgers are probably the best sellers ever. We do the block burger with a, a secret CBD sauce and people the just love sauce. it. <laughs> yeah, also, believe it or not, truffle fries, we use uh, potato flats. It's incredible sell. Uh, also, um, our meat cuts, you know, fillets, they always in hangers. Yeah. And as far as drinks? World Fashion was the best seller in the month of September. Then Negroni and then Mellow Berry. Okay, I love the names for the drinks. Did Absolutely, you name them? yes, I have. The Stony Negroni, the Mellow Berry, there's the. World Fashion. The old World, World, World Fashion, World that's right. Fashion. That's right. There's the bacon and eggs. No, bacon. Bacon, and, bacon and eggs, yes. That's a fun one too. Yes. I actually had a bacon garnish across the top. That's right. Egg white drink, like a pisco sour style drink. Yes, yeah, really let, yes. It was, it's beautiful. It was beautiful. It's a lot of fun. So, I'm going to finish my drink. Sure. <laughs> Please. <laughs> and enjoy this, this lovely day out at Astoria. So, people can find the place. It's Adrian Block, and it's a different than usual spelling. It's A D R I A E N. E N, correct. He was basically an explorer called the Hexley Bridge. Located in Australia, by by Australia Park. You can follow us on Instagram as well, adrian.blog.nyc. Thank you so much for coming, Kevin. Thank you. I'm Marina Vitage, Digital Content Director at Wine Enthusiast Magazine. And in this episode of Wine Basics, we're giving you wine tips for beginners. Here are some tips for finding great bottles on a budget and how to kickstart your education. One, invest in decent stemware. Look for glasses with medium-sized bowls that are versatile enough for all wines. Hand washing will keep them looking their best, but if the stems are dishwasher safe, use a top rack. Two, get a few more wine tools. For example, keep wine sleeves in your freezer to quickly chill or keep bottles cool. Also, find a comfortable wine opener, whether it's a small waiter's friend or an easy to use lever style corkscrew. Three, keep your wine comfortable. The worst place to store wine is on top of the fridge where heat and vibrations can wreak havoc. If space allows, put your wine rack in a room without direct sunlight. If your new abode is too tiny, store your wine in the coolest and darkest part of your apartment, like the closet. Four, when you find a wine you simply adore, Jot down the details in your wine journal or your smartphone. Note the producer, vintage, wine name, purchase price, aromas, and flavors. Be sure to also include your overall impression of the wine. Five, become friends with the clerk at your local wine store. Add yourself to the store's email list to stay informed about in-store events and sales. Attend free tastings so you can try before you buy. 
and ask for bargain wine suggestions. Clerks are always happy to share great finds. Finally, take advantage of frequent shopper or case discounts to build your wine collection. I'm Marina Vitage. Thanks for listening. For more wine basics tips, visit winemag.com slash wine basics. That's it for today's Wine Enthusiast Podcast. To read more about wine, visit winemag.com or pick up the current issue of Wine Enthusiast Magazine to see our annual Best Buys list, 100 wines under $15. You can subscribe to the Wine Enthusiast Podcast on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, or wherever you get your podcasts. And please, write us a review. We'd love to hear what you think. We'd also love to stay in touch. Use the hashtag Wine Enthusiast Magazine and follow us on Facebook and Twitter. You can also send us an email at podcast at winemag.com. The Wine Enthusiast Podcast is produced by Marina Vitage and Mike Sargent. See you next time.